Really delighted to welcome you all here. Such an impressive number. I'm really pleased that so many people at the start of term are focusing on their professional development and thinking of their students as we all are at this time of the year. Uh, British Council School has been in operation since 1940. We used to be in the Palacete in General Martinez Campos. We've been here since 1990, and we have almost 2,000 students, pupils aged from 3 to 18, who study here, uh, right up to the bachillerato bilingue, the bilingual bachillerato, when they then go on to university, either here in Spain or in the UK or the States. So you're just going to see our secondary building today, Across the bridge is our primary and early years, and if you'd like to join us and visit any time, you'd be very welcome. Um, I'm an English language teacher myself by training, so I understand the issues that you're going to be looking at today. And I'm going to welcome Rod Pride now to, as director of the British Council in Spain, to formally open the conference today. Have a great time, look forward to meeting you somewhere else Later on. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Stephen. It's time to respond with a microphone like this. I have the very easy task of just saying a very warm welcome to everybody to the British Council School and to another edition of the Teachers' Conference. Thank you very, very much for making the time to come. We've even brought you some special British weather. But, uh, <laughs> and I would like to, to say big thanks to Gillian and her team at the school, and a big thanks to all the British Council team who've been working hard to get us to this point. So thank you all very much. Uh, I should say that apart from those who are in this room, you'll see from the cameras that we're, we're live streaming, as we've done in previous years, to various parts of the globe. So uh, if I'm going to misbehave, I'm going to make sure I do it off camera. I'd just like now to say, I don't want to do too much of an introduction because Mark Levy is going to do that, but just a few personal words about Graham Stanley without wanting to embarrass you, who's going to do our plenary in a minute. Graham Stanley is definitely one of the, the leading lights in the whole world of technology and language learning and teaching, coordinator of the, of the Learning Technology Special Interest Group at IATEFL, and uh, a, a very well-known and rising author. I'm very pleased to say that this year Graham won uh, the equivalent of an Oscar, an Elton, which is the British Council's awards for very innovative work in, in language learning and teaching. It's a real pleasure uh, to have Graham here with us today, and I hope he doesn't mind if I say that um, lots of great things about Graham, but one of the things that you say yourself is that uh, you've been in the British Council for 13 years, you've been playing with computer games since the age of 13, and he's in that wonderful space where work and play kind of intersect. Is that fair, Graham? Hope so. Anyway, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Have a fantastic day and I hope you find it fun and rewarding. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Mark Levy. Hi, hello. I'm not going to do another welcome, but great to see so many old faces again. I just need to take you through some housekeeping and then pass it on to Graham. So I've got a list of things. I'm going to forget half of them, but we'll try. Um, you've got your packs, yeah? And in your packs, you've got a variety of things. You'll see some information on our Language Rich Europe project, which is a project that uh, is looking at multilingualism and plurilingualism in Europe. If you're interested in that project and you want to be involved in how we're looking at education through that project, then uh, please go and visit us on the desk, our British Council desk, um, and there's uh, information there about the project. And also, those of you who want to come to any of the event, there's a place where you can sign up as well. That's Language Rich. Um, you'll also see there's a pack from Microsoft who've given us some information about some of their uh, free learning tools for teachers and schools. So that's information that's also in the pack, which you might find interesting. Um, you'll find, as always, our, uh, our scorecard, our feedback uh, sheet. And if you want a certificate, then we do a swap. You give us some feedback, we give you a certificate. Okay, no certificates without feedback, so it's up to you. Um, and uh, then you can give those in again. At the, I think it's at the desk as well, upstairs as you leave. No, on the desk, the same desk that you signed you signed in, the, you registered on. They'll be set up in exactly the same way. Okay, so that's that. Um, you'll see around the building there are banners advertising some of our new learning apps, um, mobile applications uh, for, for mobile uh, phones and for iPads and tablets. Um, and they've got QR codes. I think there's also information in the pack, so you can go straight to some of those apps. 
download them and play with them. Not during Graham's session, but at other times. Um, but it'd be nice if you want to try out some of those. Um, important information, fire exits. Um, if the alarm does go off, in a very unlikely uh, case that it does, given the weather, um, we're out there in the rain if you're downstairs. If you're in the canteen afterwards, in the in the canteen, um, that's where we'll have the uh, coffee break and all the publishers are up there. And again, it's straight out to the football pitches from there. If you're on the ground floor, then it's through the volleyball court, which is just above us, and again, down the stairs to the football pitches. That's the, the exit. There will be bells that you'll hear um, to start the session. The first bell will be for the 11.10 session. Um, so that's not a fire alarm, okay? That's a bell. <laughs> Uh, but if it goes on for a lot longer, then it's a fire alarm. But the bells will start and finish of every session, okay, to give you uh, some idea of the timing. And the toilets, uh, again, are outside the door here and on the corridors at the beginning of both of the corridors. Um, what else? I think I've got other things down here to say. Can I have a second bite? Okay. He's the fourth. Forgive, no, forgive me if you're going to be a bit sleepy this morning. Uh, two very important things that in my, I forgot to say. One is. Pilar Medrano, big thanks for joining us in the round table. It's very kind of you. And without you, without British Council people, we wouldn't have a conference, but we certainly wouldn't have one without the support of the publishers and exam body. So a big thanks to you. Thank you. And uh, a couple other things. Those of you who are tweeting, the uh, hashtag for the conference is hashtag ESBCConf. Okay, so if any of you are tweeting and you want to tweet about the conference and the sessions, that's the hashtag. If you want to access the Wi Fi, um, the code for the Wi-Fi is capital B, small r, yeah, one, small t, capital L, zero, small g, zero, eight. I think we'll have to put that up somewhere on our stand, but um, that's what I've been asked to say. And I think that's probably enough. I probably missed something out. I'm sorry for anybody who told me to say something else that I've forgotten. Um, so just to pass you on to Graham, who, as Rod has said, is our most, one of our most international of trainers. In the last year, Graham has given plenaries in Hungary, Poland, Latvia, Argentina, Brazil, and I think Japan was recently as well. So there's plenty of places where people are desperate to come and see him, and we're very lucky to have him here with us in, in Madrid. So I'm going to pass it on to Graham. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, Rod, for that uh, uh, great introduction. Um, and thank you, thank you to all of you for coming today on this wet uh, autumn day, I suppose. Uh, hello to everyone on the stream. Uh, thank you for joining us as well. Um, I'm hoping that very shortly my slides will appear behind me. But in the meantime, can you put your hand up, please, if any of you play computer games? So I think we've got less than about a third of the people in the audience play computer games. Okay. Um, could you put your hand up now if you have students who play computer games? Okay. Just about all of you, I think, have put your hand up. And that's one of the reasons why I think what I'm talking about today uh, is worth hearing. I hope you agree. Um, and I hope by the end of uh, what I have to say, uh, you go away and try out some of these ideas, or at least think about it, or talk to your students about uh, computer games. Okay. So, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, gamification. Can you put your hand up now if any of you in the audience have heard this word before, gamification? Okay, a few of you. Gamification is basically about using um, the uh, ideas behind games in non-game situations. Still no slides. I'll just come to them. Um, and it's become a particular buzzword at the moment. Now, um, apart from education, a lot of people are looking at uh, gamification as a way of uh, inspiring people to do things which perhaps are not much fun. And this is what this is all about, gamification, and the idea of using computer games in the classroom. I think the idea is to uh, put a lot of fun into the class. Now, 
Nicole Lazaro, I think is her name, uh, came up with this idea of four, there are four um, types of fun. One type of fun is, she called it easy fun, which is the kind of fun that you have when you're relaxing with friends or on your own, kicking back, just sort of relaxing, having fun, maybe watching TV, etc. Then there's another kind of fun which is hard fun. Now hard fun is the kind of fun that comes from um, doing something which is mentally taxing. Okay? So I don't know if any of you play Sudokus, do crosswords, that kind of thing. That's hard fun. It's definitely fun. You enjoy it. You do it because you enjoy it. Um, but it's something that actually requires the brain as well. Yeah? That's hard fun. Then there's people fun, which is uh, the fun that you have with other people, uh, obviously, uh, so in social situations. And the final one, final one is serious fun. And that's fun that comes out of work in general. Okay? And I think when we talk about fun in the classroom, then um, I think uh, what we're looking at here is uh, hard fun and serious fun. That's the kind of fun that we want our learners to enjoy when they're uh, studying a language. Okay? We want them to use their brains. We want them to do something serious as well as having fun. It's not just about, uh, and as a young learner teacher I know that, just making sure that the students are enjoying themselves. They've got to be learning as well. So it's with uh, that proviso that all of the things I've talked today about using computer games or game design techniques uh, in your classroom, it's all about doing it with the idea of only doing it if the students are learning, okay? Because I think mean, it's quite easy just to put a computer game on and ask the students to play it, but that's, this is the point. The whole point is you should only ever do that if it's advancing their language learning. If it's doing something that uh, will uh, help the students progress. Okay, so that's what gamification is. Okay, using game thinking, game design techniques to enhance non-game uh, context. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of uh, hard fun, I think you could call this. Uh, this is something you can use in your classroom. It's a kind of logic puzzle. Um, I'll read this out as well for the benefit of anyone who may not be able to see that on the screen. Uh, what I'd like you to do is work out this puzzle. So you've got two people, you've got Tal's men who always tell the truth, and Tal's females who always lie, and then you've got Fru males who always lie, and Fru females who always tell the truth. My question is, could you think of a simple question to ask uh, one of these people which would only be answered yes if the person is a through male. Okay? If you could turn to the person sitting next to you and see if you can work that out just for uh, 30 seconds or so. I'm not going to give you a lot of time. to work this out. Um, there are a num it's not an easy question to answer. Or, or, or do you think it is? Yeah? I'm sure a couple of you have got the answer. Yeah? Um, well, the answer is, really, it depends on whether you can determine the sex of the tiles and fruits. If you can determine the sex, then it becomes more easy. 
becomes easier. Okay, you can answer one of these four questions. Are you female? Are you male? Are you from the Fru family? Are you from the Tals family? But if you can't determine the sex of the Fru or the Tals, then you can only ask one question that will give you the right answer. Does anyone know that? Okay, I'll give you the answer. You have to ask, are you a Tals female? Okay? And the Fru male would say yes. Okay, um, that's an example of um, hard fun, okay? And it's the kind of thing that involves language as well. So it's a great thing to do in the classroom, okay? And it's a kind of game to play. It's not really gamification though. So I'm going to look now at gamification, then I'll return to computer games in particular. But the point I wanted to make is that it's, gamification is not just about computer games, it's about uh, games in general. Now, there are lots of uh, different applications of gamification uh, that have to do with different um, areas of work and other uh, things. Um, I'm not really going to talk about much of those uh, today, if any, but what I will say is that if you are particularly interested in learning more about gamification in general, and there's a fantastic course which is free to take at the moment, which uh, is this one here. It's uh, run by Coursera. And I can see some of you writing down uh, links and stuff. This presentation uh, is online. You can have a look at it after I've spoken later today or tomorrow or whenever. And I'll give you the link to where you can find it at the end of my session. Okay? So, why play games? Why be interested in using games with students? Well, I think there are various reasons for that. Uh, first of all, games are a kind of more natural way to learn than traditional classrooms, as Clark Eldridge puts it here. And they're also uh, something which have been around, games have been around a lot longer than classrooms. It's also, you've probably noticed the rise in popularity of, of uh, computer games as a medium. As computer games get better, and they've got a lot better over the last five years, even over the last couple of years, they've got a lot more uh, realistic, a lot more sophisticated, then more and more people are playing them. Um, as Rod said, I've been playing games since I was 13. Uh, there was a sort of period in my 20s and early 30s and I kind of you know, was a little bit embarrassed about saying that I played computer games. Um, I think it's interesting to see that the stigma is now sort of disappearing uh, when it comes to computer games. More and more people are playing uh, as adults. Yeah. The average gamer is around 30 years old, I think, now. And it kind of rises every year. Okay, games are fun, of course. And we talked a little bit about uh, four types of fun before and they capture the learner's attention. You can also use them for language production. And even if you don't have a computer in the classroom, or if you don't have access to computers that you can take your students to, you can, you can get a lot of language out of using games as a subject with your learners. Talk about games, find out what games they play. What do they do? Get them to talk about uh, the characters, the worlds, the situations, there's a lot of narrative there. So um, the average console game takes about 100 to 300 hours to finish. 90% of console games people don't finish. But that's a lot of time that a lot of your students are, are spending in these uh, environments. So they become a lot more vivid to them as examples. The characters and the worlds that uh, they play in uh, are fantastic examples for you to use if you want language production from students, I think. Um, as I hope I'll show you a bit later, uh, games you can adapt for language uh, teaching as well. So if you do have access to computers in the classroom or a computer room, that you can take learners to, then there are lots of things you can do. 
Um, Miles Berry in the UK did a survey uh, in his school, uh, secondary school, about uh, things that the students did with technology at home that they liked. And he put it into a little tool called Wordle, a word cloud generator, that the biggest response gets the largest font size. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. And you can see clearly that the favorite thing that these students did at home was play games. Another one of the questions he asked was uh, about what the students preferred to do at school. And you can see games came up as a very important thing there as well. Okay, so that's the why. Let's move on to the what and how. Um, again, if you're a teacher who doesn't have access to a computer in the classroom, you can still gamify your classroom. And again, I, I invite you to come and uh, afterwards have a look at these uh, two um, ideas of how, well, it's documented uh, the blogs basically where two teachers, James York and Daniel Brown, two teachers of English, have documented what they've done in their classrooms to turn them into role playing games. So, why would you want to do that? Well, uh, partly it's about fun, but it's also about um, the way we grade students. Okay? The way we grade students, pass, fail, A, B, C, D, to a large extent, uh, some people, some teachers believe that is very demotivating. And both James and Daniel have decided to uh, take on board the idea of grading that comes from games, the type of grading that goes on in games, instead of the grading that's typically used in school. What that means is all of the students start off with zero XP. XP stands for experience points. This, is, uh, this term comes from role-playing games. Okay? And whatever the students do, they earn experience points. So if they do some homework, they get some experience points. If they answer things in class, they get experience points. Okay? All of the positive things that they do earn them points. Okay? And those points uh, are uh, given to the students, and at a certain number of points, they reach a level. Okay? This is how a lot of computer games work, a lot of role-playing games work. The idea is that you level up is the term. So you get so many experience points, you go to the next level, the next level. It's kind of competitive within the classroom environment, but it's more about the individual, because each student knows that they can, it's up to them how many points they get, because it's very much a matter of if they do more work, they get more points. So although they're competing with the other students, they're not competing with the other students to see who uh, wins and who doesn't win, because everybody wins in this system. Okay? And if they have fewer experience points than their uh, classmates, they know what they have to do to get more. And as students reach levels, uh, the first one to reach a level, then everybody wants to reach that level as well. And it becomes a, a very motivating thing to do. Again, I don't have a lot of time to talk about the details here, but I do recommend that you have a look and see these two uh, variations of how to do that. Something that's become very, uh, a lot of people have become very interested in, uh, there's a whole book about it, okay, turning your classroom into a multiplayer classroom, which is, uh, um, was developed by a game designer called Lee Sheldon. Lee Sheldon talks about uh, his, and he documents his attempts of um, turning uh, his classroom into uh, this role-playing game situation using levels and points, experience points, and what worked and what didn't work and why it didn't work. So if you're particularly interested in this, this is a book I recommend. Um, in ELT, um, my co-author Kyle Moore and myself have written a little bit about uh, gamification in language teaching in our book Digital Play. Uh, 
I've got some more stuff coming out next year related to it. One of the things uh, that I've done, um, again, you won't be able to see this very easy, but the idea of having levels associate with different experience points and grades. Yeah? So for teachers who want particular grades, they exist as well. Um, you have to be careful, of course, that they are realistic. What I was quite um, interested in is yesterday I found out that um, I wrote a blog post about this, uh, the idea of using um, uh, levels uh, with students. And that blog post was taken by a teacher in Turkey, Dave Dodgson, and he's tried it out this year and has started adapting some of the ideas. If I'd had time, I would have actually uh, put that in here to show you what he's been doing. Because it's quite exciting that somebody uh, takes something and then puts it into practice and then develops it and takes it further. So I'm quite interested in knowing how well that works out. But so far, uh, it's going really well. OK, I'm going to turn now to what you can do if you do have a computer in the classroom, um, either with a projector or an interactive whiteboard. and. One of the exciting things I found out this week, it's not ready yet, but it will be very shortly, is that the British Council's website, Teaching English, is about to launch a kind of virtual uh, star chart, if you like, um, that will, it's tentatively called the Progress Generator, that will allow teachers to keep a sort of virtual record of their students and the points that they uh, uh, earn. So it's a bit of, bit of gamification that the Teaching English website is going to be putting into practice that's very much directed towards, uh, as you can probably tell, young learners and uh, English language teaching specifically. There are other sort of, sort of virtual star charts available. This is one of them that I particularly like that you can adapt to the language classroom. It's called Class Dojo. And what it does is that you put a list of your students into the program and it assigns a, a monster avatar to each of them randomly. Okay. Again, it's probably very good for primary students. I'm not sure uh, if adults would, would like to that. Although I did present this um, at a conference um, once and a teacher who taught in the military academy was very excited because she thought her soldiers would really like this. She didn't quite understand but she thought, yes, you know, anything that uh, is a bit of fun, even if it's sort of uh, this type of fun, would, would actually be uh, well thought of. Okay, so you assign your, you put your class list in, it assigns and generates an avatar, a monster avatar. And then during the class, at various stages, you can uh, reward students in the same way that you would reward students by ticks or stars on the wall of the classroom. Yeah? So it's very similar to that situation. In that, in that sense, it's not really anything different to what primary school teachers have been doing for a long time. Now, you can decide. These are some examples that come with the program. You decide what the students get points for. You can adapt those. You can change them. It's flexible enough for you to put your own in. You can also give negative points. And there are sounds that appear when these points are given. Uh, and again, you can decide which ones, your homework, late, disruption, etc., that you give the students. Where it becomes quite interesting is the way that it, uh, it collects this feedback. So uh, here's an example of where all of the students, you can give the award to all students or to individuals, and what their points are reflected on the board here. If they get any negative points, you can see. Uh, um, it comes up like that. But where it becomes particularly interesting is at the end of the class. At the end of the class, it uh, gives you a breakdown of how the class has done. Okay? So how many students were late, uh, how many students didn't do their homework, their, uh, their participation, etc., etc. You can look at the, uh, these figures per student as well. So you can look at individual performance and um, Oops. You can also uh, look at it in a week, a month, a term, or over the year. Okay. 
So it gives you as a teacher, rather than having to rely on your memory or having to make sort of detailed records, quite interesting statistics to help you when you're talking about particular students, either to the students, you can sort of talk about their behaviour over time, to parents, to other teachers, etc. Yeah, it gives you quite a lot of interesting information that's quite easy to record. You know, it doesn't really take you much effort to do it. Okay, for all the kids, what I showed you before of the teachers who are sort of adapting their um, classes to role, uh, using role-playing game systems, well, there is a system called Chore Wars, which uh, can let you uh, adapt. It's not ideal, I have to say, for the language classroom, but it does let you uh, use the system in the language classroom. I've tried it out with one class. Um, Chore Wars exists as a website that was developed for, as the name implies, for any chores that uh, people do that you don't particularly like doing. For example, who here in the room likes ironing? Oh, somebody put their hand up. You can come to Barcelona and iron my shirt. Yeah, this is great. I'll, I'll give you my address later. Uh, what about washing up? Oh, great, you can come and do my washing up. This is great. It's uh, fantastic. But most people don't. Yeah. Now, the idea is uh, to motivate people to do this, especially if you have kids in the house, or if you live in a student house, yeah, you can use this website if you have people who like playing games. So basically, you assign tasks to chores, and the people in the house get points for doing those chores. Um, there's a, an interesting anecdote to the student house situation where one of the flatmates, uh, she said that her three male uh, flatmates never did anything in the house. She discovered this, and her situation in the flat was completely uh, transformed. She found that her flatmates would compete with each other, sometimes getting up at 6 a.m. in the morning to clean the kitchen floor <laughs> on a Friday, just so they could get the points. <laughs> it's true. And so this changed her life. She's, uh, yeah. Okay, anyway, that's a way you can use it to gamify your domestic uh, arrangements, to do all the chores to get your children or the people you live you live with if they don't do chores to do more chores if they're into games okay but how can you do anything in the classroom why one a couple of years ago now i was teaching a group of teenagers uh, preparing themselves for the first certificate exam and the last stretch so they were doing lots of exam practice activities and they were really quite getting a bit bored with it it's pretty much into the kind of things that they need to do was to really sit down and do lots of, uh, of these activities to, to get better at the exam, uh, the parts of which they were weak at. So I found this at this time and I decided to set it up as a game. And I knew half of the students in the class were avid gamers. They played role playing games. And what I did was I assigned uh, these are the students they chose their avatars, they chose their names, they set up their accounts. And then what you do as a uh, as the teacher, again, you might not be able to see this very well, but you can assign adventures. You assign adventures for your uh, students to do. So in the case of the, the house, cleaning the floor would be the adventure. <laughs> Doing Graham's ironing. Uh, in the case of my class, and what it was, it was doing particular parts of the first certificate exam. Because I wanted to encourage them to do more at home. And so uh, they could have perhaps had more imaginative names, these adventures. I mean, I think the next time I, I do it, I'll do, I'll do more imaginative names. But I basically just use the parts of the exam. So one adventure was the reading part one adventure. <laughs> writing part one adventure. And for each of these adventures, I could specify how many gold pieces they would get for completing it, how many experience uh, points they would get for doing it as well. 
And this became an interesting way of talking about the exam, a more a different way, because we sat down and I showed them this system and we talked about, okay, the most difficult parts of the exam we should give more experience points to. Because if you do that, you get more experience points. And so it was a way of making talking about which parts of the exam were difficult more interesting. Um, how did it go? Well, uh, half of the class, as I said, were role-playing games, gamers, and they loved it, and they used it. The other half sort of looked at me as I thought it was a bit strange. Okay. So I kind of didn't make it, after I introduced it, I didn't make it a highlight of the class. My idea was if they really took to it, then I would have, have sort of made that more of, a, more of a thing in the class. As they didn't, I kept on referring to it, but at the end of the class. I would take note of what they'd done, and I would enter the points. So it became a way of me recording their results with comments, because I could do that, writing the results in tests with the comments. And I could look at the, uh, the chart with their points uh, as an overview to show them how well they were doing. And look, again, you could, I, can't, I haven't got a screenshot of this, but you could look at the specific parts of the exam, the specific adventures, and see what they were doing well as well. So it's just another interesting way of presenting something which is a little bit dry. There's a mobile version as well of this kind of game system. Okay, I'm going to turn now, that's basically gamification. So taking ideas from uh, game design and adapting it to the classroom. I'm going to look now at some actual computer games and what you can do in the classroom and how you can use computer games with students to practice language. And if we have time, I'm going to get Gabrielle here to be my guinea pig. We can. We can't? Okay. I don't think we've got time, unfortunately. I was going to get him to play uh, a couple of um, computer games, but uh, never mind. Okay, so I'll just talk about them anyway. Um, you can use computer games and adapt them. This was the whole point of our, this is the whole point of our blog and our book, is that, again, coming back to what I was talking about earlier, the whole point of doing this is only if it uh, furthers your uh, aims in the classroom. Yeah? If it makes the students uh, practice more, or if it's a different way to uh, do writing or reading, if you think it's going to motivate them, then it's a good way of doing it. It's not only about young learners, it's also about uh, well, teenagers, adults, can also benefit from this. Okay, first game I'm going to show you is particularly good for um, for adults or late teens, and it's quite a challenging game language-wise. So you can play it and adapt the language in the classroom, or you can um, you can actually deal with the vocabulary it looks at. It's called Spent, and it's a game that was developed by a U.S. Uh, charity that. Uh, wanted to raise awareness about what it is to be unemployed in the US. Okay? So they wanted to sort of uh, make something that was kind of fun but educational. Okay? And again, this kind of fun is a very serious fun, yeah? because unemployment obviously is not fun for anyone. So um, what it does is that you have to survive a month on a particular salary and you have to make some difficult decisions. It's a reading game. So all, all it is is text. It's animated text with sound. And again, I was going to get Gabriel to play it, but we, we won't do that. Um, and it comes up with different dilemmas. So first, first dilemma is you're out of work. You need to find a job very quickly. And you have a choice of three jobs. Each one has a different salary, uh, different working conditions different requirements, etc., and you have to make a decision which job you want to do. Okay? And that's the basic how the game uh, starts. So how you can play it in the classroom, you could set it as homework, and the students just play it, and then they tell you, write about it, or discuss it afterwards. Or you can play it in the classroom to generate speaking. You divide the students into groups, and whatever the dilemma is on the, uh, on the screen, you ask them to talk about the dilemma and make a decision, a group decision. Then you ask the groups, and if there are any differences in opinion about what to do, 
you would get them to give the, their reasons for deciding their choice, and then you take a vote. That's basically it. It's a great thing because uh, the, there are lots of dilemmas. So if there's something which is not uh, controversial or easy to decide, you just move on. Just move on to the next one. And when I play it in my class for the first time with a group of teenagers, it, it led to probably the most interesting discussion we had all year, um, which is one of the reasons why I became a fan of this game. Um, when we got to the point about the family pet, okay? So the family pet is sick. That was the, um, the, the dilemma. And you had three choices. You could either uh, pay for medicine for the family pet, uh, which cost a certain amount of money. You could, um, I remember the second choice now, but the third choice was you could uh, have the pet put down. Okay. Now, uh, interesting enough, I found the reasons for this were, were, were two. The, people, the students playing the game, there were two very different mindsets. There were students who were playing the game who had the objective to finish the game. So they were kind of divorced from the game. And what they wanted to do is that they wanted to make the decisions that were the right decisions so they would win the game. Okay? That's a kind of ambitious player's point of view. And then you have the other type of player in the classroom who are the players who are in the game. And they're making the decisions based on what they would do as human beings. That's like the empathetic point of view of playing. So you can play this game in two ways, either ambitiously or empathetically. And this is where we had the big discussion, because the ambitious players just said, put the dog down, we don't have the money. <laughs> yeah, so they knew that the whole point was to survive. It's a computer game, no dog was actually going to die. So, I, I mean, I, I like to think that my students weren't <laughs> called uh, to sort of actually think that. I, mean, uh, I hope so. But then, um, and the other students were like, it's our family pet. You can't put the dog down. We've had the dog since we grew up. And they were playing it from the... And so this develops into a very interesting argument with the ambitious players actually arguing the point of view from the game point of view which is where the, the, the mismatch in, in sort of ideas came from. And that was it. That, that was the rest of the class. Lost. Not really lost. It generated an incredible amount of language, a very heated discussion. And the students went away and finished the game themselves. And then they wrote about their point of view afterwards. So it was a very useful thing to do. It's a game that has lots of different levels. You can be very flexible with it in the classroom. You can play it and see what happens. And as a teacher, this is, your, this is where you have to uh, use your skill and guidance as a teacher. You decide what to focus on, whether, whether it's particular language of the game or whether you just want to sort of get fluency out of it. Um, on our blog, you can find lots of, uh, some lesson plan ideas uh, for how to exploit this game for language as well. Yeah? Using particular, it's a particularly good game with uh, American uh, vocabulary. There's a lot of very rich American uh, vocabulary in there. Okay, another game that you can play is the game that has a narrative. And this is one, and again in our blog we have lesson plans for this. It's called Heather Dare. You take the, uh, you take the role of a, an explorer in an African country looking for a hidden <coughs> tomb. And because it has this uh, narrative to it, um, this is probably a game, you get the students, you do the pre-game um, in class, you do the post-game in class, and the students play the game at home. You don't want the students to waste their time playing this game in class time. You get them to do that all at home. But what you do in the pre-game, and again, you'll see the links for these, I know some of you are trying to see what the link is. On the, uh, at the end, I'll give you a link to the wiki with all of these links and, and other things. Um, how I presented this with, with, it, with one class was, it, because it's a game which requires you finding objects and then uh, actually using these objects in combinations. You find one 
a few objects and use one object with one or other objects to, to do something. So I put the objects together and I asked the students to sort of use dictionaries to find out what some of these words were because obviously some of these words are quite uh, challenging. Okay. Um, claw hammer, canopy, wheel chock. Yeah. Um, they're probably not the kinds of words that the students would come across on a day-to-day -day basis, but students who do play games will come across this kind of vocabulary. So it has value in that sense. Again, vocabulary is, might be one of the reasons why you choose or don't choose a particular game. With this class, it worked very well. And then I wanted them to sort of uh, come up with ideas of how they would combine these, uh, these things. So, for example, what do you think you would do with a hairpin and a shed? Any ideas? Yeah, you take the hairpin and you use it to open the lock of the shed. So, this is the kind of language that the students have to produce. You use it to, you know, it's used for, you can use the hairpin for, you know, so it's a, an example of a structure that uh, you want the students to be able to use. Yeah. What is it? It's a kind of thing that, yeah. So once they have their ideas of what to do, they then have part of the solution of the game. So they then could go away and play the game because they knew what to do with the, uh, the objects that they found. Okay. And then they'd come back to class and I'd ask them what happened. I'd get them to write the narrative from the point of view of the explorer of what happened to them. And there were differences because different students did things in different times. So that's one way you can use games to generate all sorts of language, speaking, reading, uh, listening. You know. This is another one. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to sort of run through these a bit quickly. Um, this is a great game to play with very young, sorry, very low level students. It's basically, there are hundreds of these. This is one of the best ones of sort of character generators. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Some of them based on popular cartoons, so if there's a particular cartoon that your students are interested in, you could use that. This is a superheroes one. And you can uh, choose a kind of basic body, put different hairstyles on, costumes, and all sorts of things, different colors, okay? So how would you deal with this? Well, what you do as a teacher is that you make uh, you make one, you make a superhero, and then it becomes a dictation. So the students then, you take your character and you say, okay, uh, my superhero is very tall. So they have to then find the body which is very tall. Uh, she uh, is wearing a green, and again, you have to, you have to choose the, what you choose to put on your superhero, depending on the vocabulary you want to to teach. Yeah? Um, she's wearing a green skirt, a yellow top, she has long brown hair, etc. And the students have to find these, understand these, so it's a listening, recognize uh, that they're all labeled as well, um, and recreate it. Then, if it goes successfully, they can create their own uh, superhero as well and dictate it to a, a partner. Yeah, again, you could get them to create it at home to save time. That's an example of uh, one of the more challenging superheroes. <laughs> okay, the third, I, I hope to show you that there are all sorts of different ways you can use games and adapt tasks to suit. A great one is as a live listening. With a live listening, you have the answers and I'll show you how to get answers in a minute, to um, a solution for a computer game. A lot of computer games are based on solving puzzles. Okay, It's this hard, fun idea again. And you use the solutions, and you tell the students what to do. And while they're at the computers, they see, uh, so you see by what they do, whether they've understood you. Okay, So it's like a comprehension that you get a visual check if a student has understood you. Okay? Uh, and this is one I was going to show. We don't have time, so I'm going to move on. Okay, finding the solution, you need to know this word, walkthrough. 
<clears throat> games that are very difficult uh, have developed a sort of a whole sort of uh, subculture of gamers who complete games and they write the instructions of those games and generally they're in English. Okay? They write the instructions of the games for other people to be able to follow. Because if you get stuck on a game, it becomes really frustrating. <coughs> you want to find the solution. And rather than spend hours trying to do something, you go to the web, you go to Google, you look for the walkthrough. And that will tell you how to solve the uh, game. As a teacher, if you find a game you think you could use that is interesting, you put the name of the game in, put the walkthrough, you'll find the solution, you print it out, or you have it so you can uh, um, you can use as your script when you're telling the students what to do. So you don't have to play the game or work out and write the solution. You take the solution that's already there. If you don't find the solution, then it's probably not a good game. Find another game. Okay? So it's a good test to see whether something's actually a good game if it's a walkthrough. Hmm. What you might have to do, and this is why it becomes a live listening, is that on the walkthrough, it might say, click here, click there, click on this, click that. What you would do as a teacher, because you're not interested in teaching that verb, or that your students here click all of the time. Again, it's this two point of view thing. Yeah? You can either, when you're playing a computer game, you can either be the person at the computer clicking, or you can be the person in the game doing things. What you want to do when you're using the game uh, with a class is imagine that you're the person inside the game. They're inside the game. So instead of clicking on the bed, you, uh, uh, or clicking on the pillow, you pick up the pillow and look underneath. Yeah? So it becomes different. Click on the pillow, or pick up the pillow and look underneath the pillow to find whatever it is you need to find. So you might have to do some sort of uh, change with that. Um, again, I'm running out of uh, time, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, there's a lot of things to help you as teachers support. Uh, a lot of material now. All sorts of websites. Most games have, a lot of popular games have Wikipedia pages, which are good to look at. There are reviews. Again, if your student, if you don't have computers in the classroom, you could always use reviews of games that your students like in the class. You can get images from Google and other places. Even in the newspapers now, you get reviews of games. Um, I've got some procedures and practicalities of what you can do when you're setting up and playing these games. You can have a look at that later if you want. Um, and some books I recommend if you're particularly interested uh, in, um, in it. On the link that I'm going to give you now, there's actually a 12-page introductory booklet of about gamification and using games that I've sort of uh, gathered together for you uh, if you want and are particularly interested to take something away so you can start using it in class. Um, and that important link is the one that's obscured at the bottom of the uh... <laughs> I'll read it out to you. It's, it's actually lear one word, learning through digital games so learning through digital games dot wikispaces dot com and there you can find this presentation the booklet I talked about and lots of other things related to games learning one word learning through digital games learning through digital games dot wikispaces wikispaces one word dot com and that brings me to the end thank you very much for listening